Welcome into the first. Well, it's not the off season for Greg. It's my off season, <laughs> though it doesn't feel like the off season this week. To be honest with you, this is still the install with Greg Cosell, that man giggling and chuckling at me. Uh, to my left is the main man himself. Greg, it has been a whirlwind. I feel like I'm busier than I have been at any point this season because the Tennessee Titans have made a coaching change, as, as many organizations do. This is a, a team that has struggled to find success over the course of the last two seasons. Uh, Amy Adams Strunk, the controlling owner here, opted to make a move on Tuesday to move on from Mike Vrabel after six seasons here. And now the questions are all, are all over the place about what philosophical approach this team will have moving forward based on what the last couple of years have looked like and a lack of satisfaction from ownership about um, evolutions that they would like to see take sure. place. Well, you know, it's funny. I've, as you know, I mean, I've been doing this a long time and I've been fortunate in my career to get to know a lot of coaches, personnel people, and Dick Vermeil, who Ron Jaworski used to be on the matchup show for years and years and years. And Dick Vermeil would come in every once in a while because um, he lives in this general Philadelphia area still. Um, and I remember something that he said to this day. And, and again, he's a lot smarter than I am. He coached in the NFL. He's a Super Bowl winner. But it really resonated with me. And he said, when you have a quarterback, and again, he's talking about, you know, maybe a first round quarterback, but in all, for all intents and purposes, Will Levis is a first round quarterback for the Titans. You know, it doesn't matter that he was technically the first pick in the second round. He's the, he was, he's their first round quarterback. Um, that everything about an organization, when you have that guy must be geared, everything he said, for, you know, he's saying it from the janitor to the receptionist to, to everybody must be geared to making that guy a great player. Because if that guy does not become a great player, and great's a relative term, you know, I'm not saying that Will Levis is going to be a Hall of Famer or should be, but everything must be geared to that guy. Because if that guy doesn't make it, in three or four years, you're right back to where you, you are now. And, so, and not a lot of other people are making it if that guy doesn't make it. Correct. So, again, I just remember Coach Ramil saying that, and it really resonated with me that that's what you have to do as an organization. Um, you know, so you can't get caught up. I mean, you can tell the media, you know, you, you do this all the time. You hear coaches talk. They can say whatever they want to the media. That's fine. You know, you've been doing it. You understand that that doesn't mean what they say in a press conference is gospel. They can say whatever they want, you know. But when all said and done within the building, everything has to be geared to making Will Levis great. So the next guy that comes in, and they have to have this approach. You know, I'm, I mean, it sounds like uh, Amy Adams Strunk will be involved in this decision making. Uh, I, I assume Rand Carthen will have input. However, that works. You probably don't know the specific answer to that, but I'm sure he'll be involved. Um, maybe others will be involved as well. Um, who knows? I'm not there. You know, you know the, the players better than I do. But when all said and done, whoever they decide as they go through the interview process, it would seem to me that that has to be the number one priority. How are you going to make Will Levis? Because Ryan Tannehill is not going to be their quarterback. We know Malik Willis is not going to be their quarterback. The quarterback is going to be Will Levis. I think that's a pretty fair statement to make. I don't think there's a question about that. Do you? There is not a question uh, to anybody inside the organization that Will Levis is not the quarterback for them moving forward. Right. So so now what what do we need to do? We need to make him the absolute best quarterback he can be, whatever that turns out to be. Maybe he becomes a top five quarterback. That would be wonderful. Maybe he's a top 10 quarterback, whatever it is, the best he can be. Okay. And I think he showed this year that he's not going to be, and I, I hate this word because people throw it around, but for one of our conversation, I'll say it. Uh, he's not going to be a bust. It's just, a, it just depends whether the quality, the ultimate quality, of what he can be, but that's what the organization must be geared toward. Otherwise you're just treading water. Yeah. And, and, you know, Greg, just to, just to kind of go off of, of that context for what Amy Adams Strunk said, and she full disclosure for people listening to the podcast, she did not meet with the media. She had to sit down with your friend and mine, Mike Keith, the voice of the Titans. And they sure. went through a couple of these things after Brable was fired. Um, but a note that she made in a five minute video, a couple of a variety of different things, was that the uh, that the next head coach does not necessarily have to come from an offensive background that the staff that they put together under the coach is as important as everything and everything to serve ultimately the quarterback and the direction that this franchise 
wants to take. But that note, because I think people are just assuming that, you know, kind of like presidential cycles, right? You go from Republican to Democrat, you go from defensive guy to offensive guy or whatever right. the case may but, be. But it's funny, you know, and, and I think a lot of people are looking at the Houston Texans. Now, obviously, they drafted the right quarterback. You could argue maybe the Texan, the Titans did, too. You know, it appears they might have. Um, but don't forget, D'Amico Ryans did come from Kyle Shanahan. Bobby Slowick, who's their OC, who I imagine the Titans will probably interview, um, did come from Kyle Shanahan. So they understand, even though D'Amico Ryans is a defensive player and coach by by nature, he understands that whole process because he was part of it. You know, now he's not the offensive play caller. Or he's not, you know, maybe he's not sitting in any offensive meetings, but he's in the building. And, you know, there's conversation, you know, coaches, you know, this coaches live this stuff you know, 24, seven, 365, you know, they don't, it's not as if they take four months off and don't do anything. They live this stuff. So D'Amico Ryan's had that background. So people point to that and say, well, he's a defensive coach. Yeah, he is, but it's where he came from. And it's the, and who he brought in as his coordinator came from that background, the Kyle Shanahan background. And he, he even goes back to the, the whole group back in Washington, as I'm sure, you know, when Sean McVay was on this, this is 2000. 13 in Washington, Matt LaFleur was on that staff. Sean McVay was on that staff. Kyle Shanahan was on that staff. Kevin O'Connell might even have been on that staff. Um, but, you know, he goes back to that whole group. Uh, so he has that background. So, yes, do you have to hire a, an offensive head coach? No, but you need someone who understands. The last thing I want to hear, you know, uh, uh, the new hire say in Tennessee is, well, you know, the quarterback's just part of our program. No, 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 no. That's not really the way it works. Uh, the quarterback, uh, what made an appearance in the statement of Amy Adams Strunk in, you know, in an, in announcing that Mike Frable was going to be fired. So the quarterback is very much at the top of everybody's minds as it should be uh, for this organization moving forward. So you mentioned Bobby Slowick and, and, and the San Francisco connections there, of course, ran Carthon, coming from that he comes uh, from there as well so he, un he look I, I know ran a little bit you've got probably gotten to know him better you know uh, i would love to you know talk to him not that he's looking for my advice that's not the point but i think he would understand that this is the way it works you know and 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 my guess is look like i said i'm not in the building um personal relationships are are something you know i don't get into because i'm not there but you know, maybe there was a little bit of a tension there just because of, of where Mike Vrabel's background versus Rand Carthon's background. You know, who knows? But the point is, obviously, Mike's not there. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would say Mike Vrabel was not a good coach. The The problem was, is that the 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 roster became a poor roster by NFL standards. And I'm sure there's many to, to blame for that. Uh, so we'll leave it alone at that because I don't know. But it, it, it's a roster that needs uh, that has holes now and they need to be filled. So they'll they'll go about that process as of course, as they uh, pursue their their next head coach and and, and kind of going back to the theme, Greg, of of serving the quarterback in in however they're going to put this right. thing together. You know, the, the name that's at the top, if not the top, but in the top three of everybody's list and requests and things ben like that, Johnson. Ben Johnson. Yeah. Um, so your, your thoughts on what Ben Johnson has done in Detroit with Jared Goff, given that that is a very tailored offensive system that they have put Jared Goff in position to succeed with them. Yeah. And, and I think I love watching the, the Lions offense, the Lions pass game, because and, and I don't know if you and I have ever talked about this just because it hasn't really come up in relation to the Titans. I know I've talked about it in, in, in other venues, but you know, one of the things that I love about Ben Johnson's offense is just his understanding of route concepts and spacing. See, spacing is a term uh, that most people hear when it comes to basketball and hockey. And obviously you have a, an NHL team there because spacing in, in basketball, you hear about it, you know, spacing and floor balance, because there's confined space in hockey and basketball. It's confined space. And people think, oh, because it's relatively small. But football also has confined space. It's just a little bigger. So whenever there's confined space, spacing of people becomes a really important thing. And what, what Ben Johnson does really well, Sean McVay does exceptionally well. I would argue Kyle Shanahan does it really well. In, in a little bit of a different way, but does it really well, um, is his route concepts 
do such a good job in, cre in, in the spacing of the routes. So that helps define the reads and the looks and the throws for the quarterback. So by NFL standards, it makes it relatively easier, you know, so that's why, you know, someone like Jared Goff, who's a very skilled thrower of the football, obviously we know he's not a movement player or run around guy, but I mean, as a pocket quarterback and he's a very skilled thrower, you know, and they do have a really good old line. Obviously that's a big difference between a team like the lions and a team like the Titans. Um, but the point is, is that it, it really creates and defines the throws for the quarterback because it's, it becomes clean. And that's one reason I love watching the Lions offense. And, you know, that's what Ben Johnson is clearly good at. Now, you don't need to have three all pro receivers to, to have that kind of offense. You know, that that's that's schematic. They've got a you know, couple of former Titans, Josh Reynolds and Khalif Raymond running around out there. There you go. Um, you know, and Josh Reynolds, even though he's not a volume target in Detroit, fits that beautifully. You know, so, again, there's a perfect example where. Coaching and scheme mean so much because Josh Reynolds obviously didn't make it in Tennessee and, and now he's in Detroit and he fills a role. He's not going to catch 90 balls for 1300 yards, but you know what? I watch the lions tape every single week. He's a meaningful part of what they do. Yes. To, to the frustration of Titans yeah. fans. Yeah. <laughs> I'm certain. Um, so, so with that being said, Greg, we, we obviously it's very, very early in this process and teams really can't meaningfully hire guys until We've made it further. Yeah, what is, do, do, do you know, I don't follow, you know, the dates closely because that's not my thing. Yeah. Do you know the dates, how all that works? So there's, there's a, I, I've got a, a, a document that I refer back to that I don't have in <laughs> front of me. Right, 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 right. Anytime this yeah. conversation comes up, because it does change seemingly every year right. now with the way that Zoom interviews are possible and, sure. and how all of that has moved along. So for the purposes of the audience, I will have to do more due diligence on but that. Yeah, I don't want to, like I said, I, you know, I'm, I'm watching tape in my office and doing all that. I'm not following all those dates, you know, Greg, Greg, it must be nice because I haven't even thought about playoff football football this weekend because the titans have been eliminated since before christmas and today right, right. it dawned upon me oh well, my god there's games this weekend that we haven't well, even is, talked about yet in case you don't know this is super wild card weekend okay th thank you for reminding me about that. <laughs> <laughs> so with that said the nfl matchup show will get you ready for super wild right. card weekend which of course begins in earnest on saturday um the games on the board greg there's six of them in the super wild card weekend the Chiefs and the Dolphins is going to be a fascinating, uh, a fascinating matchup. Uh, yeah, weather's going to be a little bit of a factor, from what I gather. Uh, Miami, uh, Miami really could have used that home field advantage. Uh, unfortunately, although I will them. say this, and you would probably agree, you don't live in a truly cold weather city, but no one is used to fifteen or twenty below. I don't. I mean, obviously, Miami is is players will not be, you know, will not feel good at all. But no one is is comfortable when it's 20 below oh greg i remember going to kansas city for the well, yeah, well you did go to indiana so you probably had some cold there oh my my blood's so thin now brother i've been in the south for almost nine years yeah. now greg you can't you, <laughs> this is as and far by the way, as i'm willing to go and by the way what happened to the hoosiers the other night at rutgers please why why would you do that to me greg they they didn't just well, see i feel the same way not maybe not quite as much as you because i'm i'm sort of second you know a second removed because my daughter went there you went there you know but anyway, we can get back to football. I just, I just, no, 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 because now you have me in my feelings. I just, they refuse to win on the road and it's going to drive me crazy all year long, but that's. Uh, well, the reason I also watched as, as much, I, I got home late and I saw, you know, I picked it up in the second half is the point guard for Rutgers, Derek Simpson. Yes. He, he went to the local high school right here. So I watched him play all through high school. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I, uh, not awesome for me on. Uh, uh, right. So I feel, I, I know his dad. I mean, I feel like an affinity for him because he went to the high school where both my daughters went. Well, I, it, since you're dressed like Bob Knight today, I, uh, I, uh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. a little Indiana basketball, but, but anyway, no. getting back to, you know, I think, you know, what I did in the, in the matchup show for that game, because I think the run game is going to be really important um, because it's funny. Um, Mike Martz uh, mentioned yesterday in, in something we, we, we were doing that it's, it's really in cold weather. It's actually harder for the receivers than the quarterback, because he said, it's like catching a rock and it's really hard to catch a ball in cold weather. He said, quarterbacks can throw it, you know, not normally, but they can throw it, but it's like catching a rock. And he said, that's where it's really hard. So, you know, I would expect, I don't think anybody is, is going to be dropping back 45 or 50 times in this game. So I actually did a piece in the show 
on the Chiefs run game because I really like Pacheco, Isaiah Pacheco, mm -hmm. and I really like what they do with their gap scheme run game when they pull their guards. And I think, you know, and I love watching Pacheco run. I mean, he's an angry man when he runs and, uh, and, and he's got a lot of juice. And, you know, I think the run game is going to be a factor. When it's 20 below wind chill, I, I just don't expect the ball's going to be tossed around the yard. Well, I, I imagine the Chiefs hope that's that that's the case, right? Because they've had all kinds of miscues in their passing game this year as a result of the receivers yep. and the drops and things like that. And Travis Kelsey not necessarily being to the form that we, I think, expect throughout the course of the season. I know he still has moments where he's certainly not on the football field. <laughs> Well, there, <laughs> there is that <laughs> looming over everything. Right, it, can't, right. it can't even escape the install podcast. It's right, got to right, make right. an appearance here too. But yes, <laughs> um, that that is uh, that is something that one would imagine. And then for the Dolphin side of things, because we are starting to get now inactives for some of these games. Uh, Waddle and Raheem Mostert are officially listed as questionable yeah, for this that. game. Greg yeah. uh, Xavier Howard though is out. They're uh, one of their corners yeah. uh, who's had a really really successful uh, career. Um, in Miami, but with with the Dolphins offense and all the different things that they try to exploit, you bring up the idea of spacing, as we talked about philosophical approaches and what yep. the Titans will explore and things like that. Nobody takes advantage of creating those opportunities the way that Mike McDaniel and the Dolphins do. Yeah, and that's a, but that's also a function of, of players with. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that because you can look at the Niners and they do a great job of it as well. And they don't have the same speed with Debo and Ayuk. I mean, Ayuk moves well. Debo is kind of a player unto himself. Uh, but the speed factor for the Dolphins is really problematic for defenses. Plus, they use motion far and away more than any team in the league in the pass game. And that creates free access. That creates all kinds of problems for the defense. When, you're, when there's a lot of motion, very often the defense has to sort of shrink its defensive menu because they can't communicate and adjust as quickly and it's harder so the Dolphins are really really good at that um but you know again can they play like that in this weather I, I certainly don't know the answer to that uh but you know you'd have to assume it can't be exactly the way it would be on a beautiful day when it's 40 degrees right, 40 degrees is still a bit chillier than Miami is used well to yeah for you for sure yeah yeah <laughs> um uh, another another game that I think is is fascinating for the implications that it could have for the road team, Philadelphia. I mean, well, the way that this season uh, has panned out and, of course, yeah. the finale against the Giants and A.J. Brown not practicing today, I saw, according to reports. They are going on the road to Tampa Bay, which may not sound like uh, may not sound like an overwhelmingly big challenge, but this Eagles team, Greg, we've talked about their struggles, um, especially down the stretch. Uh, Tampa is going to be prepared for a variety of different things that this Eagles offense can and right now cannot do. No, and keep one thing in mind is that, you know, the Eagles in two of the last three weeks have played Wink Martindale's defense with the Giants. He's now gone, of course, but so they've seen a ton of blitz, a ton of blitz. This past week, they handled it extremely poorly. Again, and there's many reasons for that. It's not one person, um, but Todd Bowles, they're the second or third highest blitz percentage team in the league. And Todd Bowles, you know, he he's he's a blitzer. He's going to come after you. And the one thing about their pressures is I think 16 of their 48 sacks have come from non-defensive linemen. And he uses his safeties extremely well as blitzers. Antoine Winfield has six sacks this year. Um, and, and even Ryan Neal, the other safety, he, he can rush the quarterback as well. And very often offensive linemen, depending on where the safeties line up and come from, don't really see them. So it's up to the quarterback, you know, teams that use the center to call protections like the Eagles and a lot of great teams do that. The Niners do that. The quarterback on those teams can always override the center if he sees something. So this is really incumbent upon Jalen Hurts in this game to see and understand that, hey, why is Winfield over there? Oh, yeah, because he's going to blitz, you know, because Jason Kelsey, once he bends down, you know, with the, over the ball, he's not seeing Antoine Winfield 12 yards off the line of scrimmage, you know, so it's it's going to be incumbent on the O-line, on, on Jalen Hurts to basically be alert for blitz on almost every play. You have to be aware of that in this game. Uh, it's going to be a fun weekend of football. And now, I mean, the playoffs are always a fun weekend oh, of yeah. football. You got the storylines beyond the matchups, of course, Rams uh, and Lions oh, that's, going that's back to Detroit. One. It's going to be great. The, the Bills being one of the hotter teams in football right now and the Steelers using some kind of witchcraft to appear yet again 
in the postseason. And, and even the um um uh what's the other game on the oh you know I mean I'm very intrigued by the by the AFC game between the Browns and the Texans. I yeah. think that's that's really intriguing tactically. Um, you know, Joe Flacco, uh, not just because he's a great story, but I mean, he'll, he's one of those quarterbacks. He understands the NFL game. He understands, hey, it's one on one. You throw the ball. That's the way it works in this league. And you know, he'll he'll sometimes he'll get picked. He's thrown a good number of picks. He's also thrown a good number of touchdowns. But he'll push the ball down the field, and he understands that that's the way the NFL game is played. And and of course, C.J. Stroud, he's going to get a ton of man coverage. He's going to get a ton of single high safety. Nico Collins has really looked like he's become a, a real quality NFL wideout. So that game really intrigues me from a tactical perspective. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the breakdowns on the NFL matchup show. Of course, you can set your DVR. Uh, you can get it on ESPN Plus on demand or wake up early Saturday morning and get your football fix while you're making your breakfast and coffee. Uh, Greg, I appreciate your time as always. Uh, look forward to watching football this weekend and talking about some of these great matchups with you as we get further and further along in the postseason now. Thanks, Buck. Yeah, this was great.